Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Can everyone hear? All right. All right. And um, thank you, Emily, and thank you, thank you, CIS, for having us here and the ability to have this conversation tonight. Um, want to preframe? Yeah. So I just wanted to preframe what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I have a little bit of notes, so it helps me a little bit. Um, so we're going to talk about a code of content, um, conduct, which is more about safety and precautions when doing this, the work that we do. Um, and then we're going to move more into our, a, a brief experience of our own personal experience about this work. And then we're going to talk about why integrating sexuality and entheogens and what, why is that important in our experience around that and helping people evolve around consciousness and their consciousness. And then we'll just wrap it up with you know, some gratitude. Also, I just wanted to say I'm really grateful for being here and grateful that you guys are all here. My heart is just really open that there are people who are interested in this work and want to learn more about it. So I'll turn it over to Nadine to share a little bit. I don't need the microphone, but I can talk a little bit. <laughs> Great, so you want thanks. to keep it up to your mouth. Okay. Close. Great. So in speaking with Emily before this evening, um, one of the things she was curious about us bringing was how we work with clients with this delicate, you know, delicate issue, particularly with safety and consent with clients and how to integrate these experiences. Um, some of us know in the world of shamanism and medicine work, particularly around sexuality, there, there's been a lot of abuse with that in some circles. And even sometimes when there hasn't been abuse, this can come up for clients or for people later on. And so Alik and I thought that we would share a code of conduct that we've come up with together and how we address this in managing safety for clients. So um, we'll go through that just for other practitioners and so that you understand a little bit about how we're working in these realms. So... So first is we, we really work with boundaries. Boundaries are really important in this work because um, I like to use that analogy. Um, there was these kids that had this huge field and this group of kids would all just stick together and play. And later on, these, you know, it's a huge area and then they ended up building this structure around, like a fence around the area. And then the kids ran, you know, spread out. They weren't together. So... When we have healthy boundaries, people can start to explore more of their consciousness in, in a healthy way. So this is what, why about the boundaries is really important with entheogens and also with sexuality. Yeah, we're going to feel a lot safer if we know where the boundaries are and if someone is holding that boundary for us. Um, also, confidentiality. When we're working with people just like in, in psychotherapy or in these other realms, you know, it's, just, you're, you're, it's really a safe space that you're holding for somebody, so you're not going to share this with anybody. Um, in, in the context of the work that we're doing with each other, we kind of check in with each other to help the client, and we, we let, the, let them know beforehand when we're doing this work that, hey, we might check in with each other when we're, when we're starting to do this work. Or we might maybe not using any names. Um, with I have a shaman that I work with and other... Um, sexological body worker people who have a little bit of background who can kind of help support people who are going through certain things yeah we have peer con consultations with other people in the field and so we do that and also there's something about Alik and I working together and letting clients know that we do share with each other it's all confidential except we do have a partnership that also provides some safety for clients so that there isn't too much privacy or secret, but they know that we're holding each other accountable and that we do seek professional opinions also in consultations. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit more about the boundaries. When we go into a session, when medicine will be used, combined with anything around sexuality, we ourselves state our boundaries explicitly, clearly, and we have the clients state the boundaries really clearly as well like everything as far as like what touch is okay and just have everything stated because oftentimes what will happen is once someone is under in that state of oneness with the medicine and with the journey suddenly their boundaries may change and so it's important for us as the practitioners to remind them of that boundary and say perhaps in the future we can explore that but this is this is where we're staying tonight and that provides a lot of safety for the clients. Um, and it's important 
to explore that in that moment. How does it feel to be told no? How does it feel to have a boundary? So, yeah, that's important. Definitely. Um, we also work with a questionnaire mm -hmm. to kind of get a little bit more background with people and, and what's going on for them around their sexuality, if they have any experience around entheogens. So, to make sure that these people are uh, capable of doing this work, because not everybody is capable, uh, has the emotional uh, ego structures that are able to handle this work. And so we have a question to filter people who might not be ready for it. Um, yes, and we won't work with someone if someone isn't even willing to really explore the questionnaire. That kind of lets us know that they're not ready. Um, and yeah, it's a good pre-screening. I have a background in psychology and psychotherapy, so we've come up with that. We also work with a, a waiver and a contract. Um, what else do you yeah. want to move to? The waiver and contract, that keeps people kind of locked in. Say, for instance, you know, keeps them accountable. Like, hey, if you're not, you know, following through with this contract. It, it, and it also keeps us as practitioners safe, too, that, you know, people aren't going to sue us or these type of things. This contract's really, um, you know. Yes. Um, also, the contract is important because we really want um, clients to know that things are going to come up. And there is a beginning, a middle, and an end to this process. We really want them around for the integration. And so, you know, we give them that information up front. You know, you might, you know, things are going to come up. Things are going to get scary. Things are going to get messy. And so with this contract, we're going to walk them through the whole process. Yeah, and a lot of times, if you don't have a contract, you know, once you start getting to the sticky part or the really difficult areas, people are like, oh, I don't want to do this work anymore. And you're like, okay, well, we just <laughs> agreed upon doing this, and now you're not wanting to do this. So um, that's why it's, I think it's very important having a contract. Yeah, so we really want to empower people, empower people to take these experiences and move powerfully forward in their lives. And so yeah. and it's about supporting people along this journey. Uh, like for myself, I never had a lot of support growing up. And when, when people can get a healthy you know, father, mother figure to help really support people, to nurture that, that had a missing experience, they didn't have that in their life, it can be really healing. When you're especially using antinogens and sexuality, a lot of our old wounds and other parents can come up. So another thing that we have in our code of conduct is humility to always keep ourselves in check, that we're being humble, that we're being truly like in service with this work, and to really have the humility to refer clients out if we feel that um, what a client is coming to us with is beyond the scope of our practice, that we have, we're willing to refer them out and not let our egos get involved, and that we have, we have a really solid network of a variety of professionals in these realms. And I think this is yeah. important. Um, transference, too, <laughs> working with um, clients. A lot of times with, with sexuality, um, people can fall in love with you. And when we're working in this, in this realm, it's, it's um, not personal. It's transpersonal. And a lot of individuals growing through this process will start to you know, attach to you especially around you know falling in love with you and, and that's what you want but you want to also let people know hey this isn't a personal thing it's a transpersonal thing like a hierarchical position like father daughter uh, mother son um, teacher student these type of things because I think a lot of times people get confused of romantic love and that you know the hierarchical love the guru love or the guru love or whatever yeah. these things and it's about empowering people Again, so that's what it's all about. It's not about us. It's about empowering them. And if they're attaching their love and their empowerment to us, then it disempowers people. And this is not what it's about. Yeah, so we make sure and really just explain the whole process of transference. Um, and a lot of mother and father issues will come up too, naturally. And so we talk about that as well. And before we work with someone... Um, Yeah, and then the other agreement that Alika and I have is that we have a safe, pa safe place with each other to share about our sessions um, because sometimes things can get, you know, maybe we'll have a misunderstanding or feel our own like uncertainty and so we create a safe space so that we can debrief with each other and like without anger or without judgment or lashing out but we like hold a safe container that we can share all of our experiences because this work can be really um, 
not of this world of duality. So it's important that we honor each other in that. Yeah, and we both have different perspectives on things. Like Nadine has a psycho psychological background. She graduated from CIS, CIS. Mm -hmm. psychology, psychology, and I have a different background of working shamanism and yoga and embodiment and these type of things. So it gives us different reflections and different ways of seeing of how to help people move deeper into um, their healing process. Yes. So now I guess we're going to move into talking about a little bit about... Um, your experience briefly with, uh, you want to go first, Nini, around uh, working with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my first experience with, with mushrooms, um, I guess about 22 years ago, I went to a rave in Bonny Doon Beach. I was at UC Berkeley, and um, I had grown up in a really conservative, conservative family. I was a Republican at that point in my life, you know, all of maybe 18 or 19 years old. <laughs> I thought I knew everything about religion and sexuality and everything. I met, I saw two men kissing that evening, and it was the most beautiful experience I'd ever seen out there on the beach. And I met them and learned their story. And it completely, in one night with this sacred medicine, it transformed everything I knew about sexuality, not only with others, but within myself. Everything I thought I knew about religion. I had even been interning with Pete Wilson at the time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, Republican. Everything I thought I knew about religion and everything um, that I knew about politics. And so from that one experience, my whole world was opened. And then I, um, I opened up to, you know, being with women and understanding my own sexuality in a whole new way, which let me understand my whole body in a whole new way. And at least annually, I continued on with this sacred group of friends to work with each other with sacred medicine, whether it's mushrooms or MDMA or other things um, around our relationships and our personal growth. So it's been amazing. Yeah. And, 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 oh, you wanted to, mm -hmm. you to, and my experience, uh, I'm just give you a short version. What was that? Oh. And uh, my experience using um, entheogens growing up was more recreationally and it was more of like a party thing and I was kind of using it to escape and then when I started working with a shaman it I started to learn how to use the medicine to work on myself and by working with the medicine I came um, with the conclusion that integrating sexuality and entheogens and the way I was taught was that you don't integrate the two and to me that felt like the most um, authentic way of how I wanted to work with the medicine because that's how I came about understanding this work that I wanted to do was integrate those two so it was a beautiful melding of the two for myself and I'm really you know excited about people who are ready to explore this on a deeper level from for me uh, working with entheogens is like the shotgun method to psychotherapy and expansion and then when you integrate sexuality um, with it which is similar because you can get both experience but when you integrate the two people can get really catapulted into another level or dimension of um, oneness and that's what it's really all about um, for me so talk about um, yeah n now we'll talk a little bit about some of our experiences working with with people um, so you can go first talking okay. about Celesti <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. and so um, we're not going to do a really in-depth case study. What we're going to do is speak, we're going to weave some of the reasons why we, we think this can be important rather than doing like one in-depth case study. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit about certain people I've worked with and of course the information has been changed a little bit for protection. Um, so one of the first people I worked with, with medicine around sexuality, um, this was a, a young man who had been molested. And the first medicine we used was MDMA. And from that experience, he was able to revisit that experience of being molested from the witness perspective. He'd never been able to separate his ego from it or his self from it. And with the gentleness of that medicine, he could come into his heart and see what had happened from the outsider's perspective. And for the first time in his life, he was able to forgive his mother for not protecting him. He was able to integrate um, a process he'd been going through where he had, hmm, 
been working on his sexuality with a lot of shame. He'd been secretly going to places that didn't feel safe to explore interest in um, anal sexuality, explore his interest in men, and he, he simply had kept that like in the shadows and had a lot of shame around it. And he wasn't integrated in his body as a man yet. He still carried his body as a young boy. So from using the medicine and diving deeply into this experience and him being in control of the situation, revisiting conscious touch in his body, he was able to explore safely in a way that he, he simply couldn't open up to before. And from that, he was able to become more fluid in his sexuality. You know, not necessarily identify as anything, but be very fluid in his sexuality and be willing to talk about that and explore it safely. And in, hmm, <laughs> in knowing this person, you know, over a year and watching his body change and grow, you know, by the end of the conscious work he did, he developed into a man. Like his whole body changed. His whole... Um, sex organs changed too. It was almost like he landed. His soul landed, his body landed, and it literally transformed so that he was moving like a man would rather than a little boy. Very connected in his lingam, you know, in his penis, and it was really powerful and beautiful to witness. You want to go? Yeah, was that you want to? No, I'll fin yeah. So that's just one, one story, and briefly I'll say some of the other reasons I think the medicine can really help people in working with sexuality, of course, is releasing shame because it just opens up the heart many times and it can really be a place where shame can be released. Um, fluidity in sexuality. I've noticed a lot of the men that I work with, they can really integrate their feminine side and become way more just balanced in their feminine. A lot of men will allow me to hold them and take on the masculine role in the work in a way that they, they weren't able to until the medicine was there. And so I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, there's of course the de-armoring of the heart that can happen, which is really powerful. There's more courage to ask for what one wants. Um, a lot of mother and father wound integration, especially when Alika and I work together. It can be a very powerful experience of almost being rebirthed into one's sacredness of their body, you know, as the mother, as the father holds you in that process. Um, I worked with a woman who told me it was the most holy experience she'd ever had in her life and felt literally as if the lineage of women and mothers were telling her, this is your body, your body is holy, this is how you go out into the world and use it. And I've heard things like that multiple times actually, when you're held in such reverence and the person is open to having safe, conscious touch. And just the lessening of defenses. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on. You're on a roll. You should have kept going. <clears throat> I'll just share briefly about some of my experience. This is working with the medicine and sexuality. I had a client, an older woman that I was working with um, for a while, and working with MDMA. Uh, she started to open up and talk about how she never had an orgasm before and you know she was married and had a few kids and and I was she had an orgasm before but not from another person and <clears throat> while we were working um, together she felt when I said would you like to explore this she was like yeah kind of in the sense like she wasn't going to be able to that was wasn't going to be able to happen like it was an impossible task and while I was working with her and she felt safe and she had this huge awakening opening. She had this uh, like Amrita um, female ejaculation experience. And for her, that was a huge release and opening. And when we had integration a couple of days later, she said that was like one of the most amazing experiences she's ever had in her whole life. And it was like a huge missing experience for her. And she was so grateful and we were both crying. And it was such a beautiful experience for me to see like, wow, this is beautiful for some people and particularly for her experience. So um, that was really one of my turning points with, with doing that work. So it's probably one of my favorite stories to talk about. Um, other ones, I've, I've worked with a few men who uh, have been abused, one by his brother. And by working with um, a particular medicine, it really 
how, how it um, unfolded was I ended up taking the role of his brother and it was more in a nurturing space so he could um, really let go and forgive his brother for you know abusing him um, and he could feel safe with the medicine and with me being there after we had built up the relationship so that he could have that that missing experience of you know he was a kid and, and he didn't feel safe um, and not safe in his sexuality not you know he was attracted to men but he couldn't and he this this particular client was married he's married and has a um, uh, a few children and he felt ashamed that he had this attraction to men and but it didn't feel safe because of that experience with his brother when he was younger um, so those are some let me just check the other ones that I was just kind of wrote down because my mind went blank um, but a lot of what it does is it just helps to release the shame with people and in a state of you know, if we're working with entheogens, you can have this God oneness experience. But when you're having a, um, if it's associated with shame around sexuality, people are guarded around that. So when you start to integrate people with working around the sexuality and then using certain medicines, it helps to release their armoring around that. And then they can have a beautiful experience of opening and oneness with the medicine when they feel safe and beautiful things can unfold. So. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah, there is. Um, I wasn't sure how to speak about this, but I think I'm ready now. <laughs> you know, one thing that's really important, too, is we always hold the medicine with the highest regard and ritual, you know, really honoring the medicine to bring that sense of God and oneness to the session, no matter what unfolds. And um, I've worked with a few people who have committed a decent amount of crimes in their life, you know, one being a, a vet who had killed people, you know, multiple people. And during that process, and, you know, I've worked with people who have raped, raped people, and um, had a lot of experience with prostitutes and things that, that they didn't know how to hold in their life moving forward. Maybe they'd changed their lives, but some of that guilt and shame and horror was really still in their bodies, particularly the man who had been in, been in the war. Um, and so when we come to do this work with a sense of sacredness, really like praying and praying to the medicine, praying to, you know, to God, really, however one, one thinks of that, to go through these processes, people can feel that, and they can feel that unconditional love from God. And in that sacred space, they can not only forgive themselves, but forgive that, f feel that forgiveness from that non-dual place, you know, from the divine. And it is incredibly powerful to then hold that process of forgiveness, of letting go, and then with, you know, the medicine and those states and the body and the movement, you can move those experiences out of the body and, and let them go, you know, give them back to the earth to be transmuted, however someone can, can let go of those things. That's probably one of the most powerful things I've witnessed in working with the sexuality and the medicine. Is that true? Like forgiveness of some of those experiences. I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, and also with the sexuality piece, you tend to, if someone has um, any trauma or um, uh, difficult experience around sexuality, when you create a safe container, you become their abuser. You become that person that, that harmed them, but you're not that person and it becomes a safe place where they can explore that and let go and have forgiveness for it um, when, when someone else is taking that experience. So they can imagine you being that person and then you can say, hey, I'm not that person, but we can, you know, um, give them a different experience of what it was for them and give them more of an expansive perspective of, okay, what was it like for the person being in that role? And in the medicine, and that's why using when you have that experience, when you do the integration piece, which is the most important piece of this work, you can give them a um, a logical, different perspective of what they weren't able to see before. And then in that moment, that's when they can start to have forgiveness for whatever happened to them in that moment, to empower them to step forward, to be in their power, instead of, you know, a lot of times people use that as an excuse to not do certain things or not to feel love or not to be themselves. And in that moment, that aha moment of like, wow, people can really 
be themselves authentically. And again, that's what for me is the goal it's about is to find your authentic truth and be yourself 100% without any shame, guilt, or fear. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I've experienced a lot of this work on the receiving end, you know, on these levels too, of course. I don't, I don't think we can really go out in the world and do this work if we don't do it on our own. Um, and I've experienced what Alika has, has spoken about, where I've been able to revisit, you know, whether it be a past perpetrator or some of those painful experiences and really transform those and being held unconditionally in that open space, like around the sexual work. Um, and I, I wrote... I wrote a story about some of my personal experiences in this work. It's on our website, if anyone's interested. And, yeah. Yeah. I think that's... Yeah. How much more time we have left? <laughs> Just so I can kind of... Yeah. Whatever amount that you want. We have uh, maybe 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Okay. Yes, it's, it's ecstatic awakenings. We also have a... Um, form on the table here if you're interested in working with us you can fill that out send your email or contact and we can get back to you if you're wanting to explore that or know any or know anybody who would like to do this work too that are willing and capable um, <laughs> um yeah anything you want to else say will i yeah that's okay um i think we'll hold my questions until the end is that, that right? Good, yeah. yeah, and we're open to talking about, you know, answering questions and talking more about this work. Again, you can go to our website. Um, yeah, I think we're going to be talking a little bit about 3D, 5D with relationships with the entheogens sure. and, and sexuality. Yeah. So one person, actually, I mean, Evelyn and I spoke about this, and someone also asked me, you know, how do I know when I'm really in service to a client? And... You know, of course, if we're working at this level, there's a piece of us that knows in our heart. And that's when we go to this place of oneness. We're working on a really, really high level in the heart, and we're in integrity. And, like, I know I'm going to do the right thing. And that's from that place of oneness. And yet we do live in this world of duality. Those beautiful experiences, and we come back to the 3D world where there's right and wrong and duality. And that's one of the reasons that I've realized how important it is to have these waivers and these conduct, you know, these contracts. codes of contracts and all of those things for protection for everyone, you know, not only us but for the clients as well. Yeah. And you want to say more about? Yeah, just that? In, in, you know, in a perfect world, um, we wouldn't need all these things, and if we're all, you know, unconditionally loving each other, um, that wouldn't be a problem. But because you know we're not quite there yet, and we're moving towards that state of evolutionary consciousness having boundaries and, and these type of things really help people to, you know, get to that place of where we want to be as a humanity and society. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you. Yeah. Yes.